Hi, this is Misha, and today we're going to talk about a revolver most of you know about, but frankly, aside from the very basics about this gun, there's not a lot of information out there, especially considering how long it was not only in service, but also production. The Russian 1895 Nagant revolver. This fires 7.62 by 38 rimmed and has the very famous gas seal cylinder that everyone talks about, so I won't go too much into the depth on that. Basically, the idea was pretty darn simple. We have a unique cartridge here where the bullet is nested inside and it's crimped over and that is mated up when the hammer is back the cylinder goes forward and that seals gas seal with the barrel the idea was to prevent loss and increase velocity and it was successful. I mean, it um, it did increase velocity, depending on the loading, about 10 to 20 percent. But it came at a cost of a very heavy trigger, even in single action, especially in double action, and making the mechanism that much more complicated. Although the mechanism is still very simple in these guns. So let's talk about it. I brought a few of them out here. This one is a 1941 Tula. Here I actually brought out my Swedish M87, which is also a Nagant, but it does not have the gas seal. As you see, the cylinder does not move forward. And this fires a much more conventional 7.5 ordnance round. We also have just a typical import refurb here. I've had this one for many a moon. And finally, I have what appears to honestly be a non-import marked example from 1921. So this gun is a double if you can call it that, single, action, seven shot, loading gate, traditional non-swing out to unload it. You unscrew this, pull it out, and like that. Very traditional classic revolver style, except for the, having double action at least. The standard barrel length is four and a half inches. Overall length is about ten and a half. And we weigh a little under two pounds unloaded. All steel. This was developed in Belgium by Nagant. Some sources claim it was both Emil and Leon Nagant. Emil who worked on the Mosin Nagant rifle. Other sources say it was just Leon. So there you go. These were adopted in 1895 and go into production that same year. The first 20,000 would be manufactured in Liege, Belgium by Nagant. And then in 1898, the Tula factory would take over in Russia and start producing very late in that year, very late in 1898. Now the reason I brought my Swede out, even though this is a Husqvarna, it is very finely finished, nice checkered walnut grips. Many parts are serialized on original Belgian Nagants as well as the Husqvarnas. When Tula took over production, they only serialized four parts, 
frame, side plate, cylinder, and trigger guard. They also went to a coarser uh, style of checkering. Of course, on this side, it's worn smooth. You can still see it here, it's walnut, but they went, they made this simpler. They also simplified many of the pins, like the lanyard, so on and so forth. So they kind of mass produced it, streamlined it for Russian, and they started to crank these out in ever larger numbers. Tula would keep making these, in fact, until the end of World War II, the Great Patriotic War in 1945. They would make two models initially, an officer's model, double single action, or an enlisted men's model, which was single action only. They would actually keep this practice up through World War I, and it would finally be discontinued in 1922. So those are the two main variants, but they did have some others. In 1906, they experimented with a slot for a stock. And in 1910, they experimented with like a Smith & Wesson style swing out cylinder. In 1911, they would introduce a shortened barrel version called the Commanders. And this would be produced in small numbers on and off for quite some time, even into the Soviet era. Next up, they would experiment with longer barrels. First, they would try a, about a, just a teensy hair under eight inch, again with a detaching shoulder stock, and then they would even go to a 12 inch with an integral stock and even like lange adjustable sights. But these obviously didn't go anywhere. There was also a training version. In 1912, the Peter the Great marking would appear right before World War one, and they would keep marking these until 1918, that way with the Peter the Great. In the middle of World War I, they would make some simplifications. For example, in 1916, they would quit serializing the trigger guard. And then, of course, the Bolsheviks took over, but they kept the gaunt production in. Now, in 1919, they tried to go to really simplified grips made of, I think it was oak, and then they would start using birch grips. Tula would first adopt the star we know today around 1921, 1922 in that period, and then the famous CCCP marking would appear around 24. So they would do some changes over time. Also, they would stop making the single action only. Actually, this one has the single action. They would only do the double single after this point, usually taking older guns that were the single action only and giving them a double action trigger. However, some guns like this one here during the refurb program would end up with the single action components. So it's kind of, you know, you'll find them from time to time. So yeah, they would keep making these through the 20s, even though it was starting to be kind of a dated design. But the Tokarev pistol, the TT-30, would experience some early, early problems and Tula had to buy new machinery to make it, so it kept the Nagant around longer. Then the TT-33 came out and it was to replace this gun here. One thing that seems to have happened in the 30s, the wood grips would be replaced with Bakelite, the Bakelite like on the TT-33. It's one of the later changes. They would also have a few different styles of front sight. This one is the one you find on most refurbs. This is a simplified version, the half globe, the moon shape, that Tula actually introduced when they went into production. Most of these sites would get replaced though during the refurb program. And this on the Swedish is very similar to the original Belgian style. So the front sight would change, although with all the refurbs and stuff, it's hard to say anymore. Well, just as the Tokara pistol was really getting to come online. The Great War began June of 41. And so they would keep Nagants in production at Tula and also in 43 in Ishesk. Now, some people say that Ishesk made them only in 43 and 44. Others say into 45. I suspect 45, they were probably using up what parts they had. But yes, during World War II, you would see some Ishesk 18 
95 Nagant revolvers. These are dependable, cheap guns, well known and respected. In fact, many were given out as presentation guns to officers during Stalin's reign. And many would not be pulled out of military service until the Makarov would come along in the 1950s. When production was finally ended in 1945, over a 50 year time span, about 2.6 million of these guns were created, counting all variants, models, types, and everything. Also after the war, like most Russian guns, these were refurbished, reblued, given new grips when needed, and put into long-term storage. Well, while the military was pretty much done with these by the 50s, 60s at the latest, that doesn't mean they fell out of service in Russia. This is a very iconic gun in Russia, even to this day. Police would use them, as would the Russian post office. And actually, when I was there first in 2004, the uh, Russian Railway Authority was still issuing the Nagant as its standard issue gun. So these would hang around in kind of secondary roles, not to mention some civilians would have them, especially ex-military, in Russia. They wouldn't get it exported outside of Russia a heck of a lot, but they would make their way around the comm block, especially into like Asia and stuff. They were dependable, simple, and at the end of the day, they were very obsolete, so Russia was happy to give them away. Now they were made briefly in Poland by FB Radom, as the NG-30 from about 1930 to about 1935, 1936. They wouldn't make a large number, and actually the reason FB was making them, they obtained the original tooling from Belgium, who had no use for it anymore. And this was basically a stopgap measure until their VIS-35, another very famous pistol from Poland, was uh, up and ready to go. So kind of a stopgap, so you will find some Polish made Nagants. I just, you know, researching this video, really trying to figure out, you find a lot of the basic info on these guns, but there's not a lot of details, really, once you get past that, because everyone just kind of repeats the same factoids, which is fine, I mean, they're correct, it's just there's not a lot, as much um, collector interest, it seems, in detail as you would uh, expect. So I thought, time for us to do a video on the Dagon. Why not? Notice the cylinder can rotate. It's a neat gun. It's a very fun gun. Some people do buy 32 caliber cylinders for these. They work, but they're not ideal. But then again, 7.62 by 38 isn't the easiest cartridge to find, and it's not at all easy to reload for, so there's that. So I don't blame them one bit. Well, if you have any questions or would like to share your own Nagant, we'd really love to hear it below. As always, if you like the video, do please click like. Also, if you haven't and could, we'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe and share. And if you'd really like to help support the channel, please do check out the link in the description to our Patreon page. By the way, this is obviously an early leather holster. This is a great war, World War II kind of combo holster. Holds extra cartridges here, cleaning rod, very simple. You get the idea. Well, this is Misha, and we will catch you very soon next time.